Well, good evening and welcome everyone to the Issachar Foundation Jamaica or public lecture series. My name is Philippa Davies, a member of the Issachar Foundation Jamaica and moderator for this evening's presentation. Welcome wherever you are, whether in Jamaica, the Caribbean or other parts of the world. And a special welcome to this evening's lecture. We haven't seen you in a long while. And our topic is Tomlinson and the Attorney General of Jamaica, the Bogri Law Decision, Why It Matters. If this is your first Issachar, Fon Issachar Foundation Jamaica lecture, warm welcome to you. This lecture series provides a discussion forum to explore public policy issues and social trends within the context of the Judeo-Christian worldview, which the foundation unabashedly affirms as providing the most sound foundation for nation building and human flourishing. We take our inspiration from the Bible, the scriptures from 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, which says, the men of Issachar understood times and knew what Israel should do. The Issachar Foundation Jamaica has hosted public lectures since August 2010. Before COVID-19, we met face-to-face, -face, but since June 2020, we migrated online, and this is our 14th virtual lecture. Some of the previous topics were moral inputs, mortal outcomes, bridging the gap between values and crime, uncovering the hidden facts about NIDS, the national ID system, Life with COVID, health, law, and liberty. Weed in the family tree, the generational impact of ganja on the brain. Keep us free from evil powers, an expose on the new ACP EU agreement. George Soros, globalism and the threat to human rights, and many more. So I invite you to visit our YouTube channel, the Issachar Foundation Jamaica YouTube channel, to view previous lectures. And if you are not on our mailing list and you would like to receive notification of future lectures, please do post your email address in the chat and you will be added to our list. After our presentation, there will be a time for question and answer. You can put your questions in the chat. We're only taking written questions and I will field those questions to our presenters. But right now I'm going to invite Bishop Alvin Bailey, president of the Jamaica Evangelical Alliance, to open this evening's proceedings with prayer. Bishop Bailey. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we acknowledge your divine presence in our midst, and we give praise and thanks to you for life, for health, and for sobriety of mind. Father, we commit this time, this lecture in your hands in the name of Jesus Christ and ask that you will give us wisdom, insight, and understanding. And Lord, you will, in fact, educate us, inspire us, and empower us, O oh God, to undertake the challenges as it relates to that which confronts your kingdom. We pray, God, that you will indeed inspire us and empower us to, for the challenges of today and the challenges of tomorrow. Bless this time, bless our moderator, and those presenters and others who will participate in this evening's lecture. We give you thanks as we wait on you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop. And now to introduce our presenters this evening, we have two, Ms. Jamila Thomas and Mr. Wendell Wil Wilkins. Ms. Thomas is an attorney at law, a partner in the firm Lambie Thomas and Company. She made submissions to the Joint Select Committee of Parliament considering abortion as a member of the Coalition of Lawyers for the Defense of the Unborn in 2008 and to the Human Resource and Social Development Committee of the House of Representatives on behalf of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship in 2019. She is also Vice President of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship and a member of the Fellowship Tabernacle, a non-denominational church. Mr. Wilkins is a Seventh-day Adventist attached to Ken Cott Seventh-day Adventist Church. He has an interest in constitutional law and justice matters, and he was a member of the legal team representing the Lawyers Christian Fellowship in the case that we will be exploring this evening, Maurice Tomlinson and the Attorney General of Jamaica. Please let us make welcome Ms. Jamila Tom Thomas, who will be followed by Mr. Wilkins. Jamila, over to you. Good night, everyone. Just want to make sure I can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, I have been tasked um, this evening with the uh, responsibility of giving 
the history or what I would call the background uh, to the recent decision of our constitutional court in the Tomlinson against the Attorney General case. And I believe that the background starts with what I would um, say is the uh, passing of the Charter of Rights. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, one moment. Is everyone seeing my screen? Yes, you are. Okay. So, so do you want to go with start slideshow? So we see the full slide. Um, no, because I'm 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 not necessarily using all the slides. Okay, so no problem. We could start, still but... on a new slide. You Are you able to slide. see? Is it big yes, enough? Yes, we can see it. We can see it. Okay. All right. So the initial um constitution of Jamaica had what was referred to as the Bill of Rights. Um, which was found in Chapter 3 of our Constitution. This Chapter 3 Bill of Rights was repealed and replaced by a new Chapter 3, which is called the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. And um, we shorten it, the Charter of Rights. The Charter of Rights came into effect on April 8, 2011. And... What the chart of right does is that Sorry, Jamila, we're actually at slide 12. Do you want to start at 12 or you want to go to one? No, I am at you're seeing chart of rights, chapter three. No, I'm seeing organized agenda. Oh, hold on. Let me hold on a moment. Uh, okay. Are you seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing no chart of rights. Chart of three. rights, chapter three, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Right, so I was saying that the original chapter three, the Bill of Rights, was repealed and replaced by the new chapter three called the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom, and that came into effect on April eighth, twenty eleven, and it contains um, the rights um, that are provided for in our constitution and these are some of the rights right to life liberty and security of the person right to freedom of thought conscience belief right to freedom of expression to equality before the law right to freedom from discrimination on the grounds of being male or female i'm not going to go into all the rights but the charter of rights contains all the rights um, in our constitution what is of importance to note in this charter is what is called the saving law clause. And the, sa the saving law clause, which is found in section 13 of the Charter of Rights, states as follows. Nothing contained in or done under the authority of any law enforced immediately before the commencement of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms Act 2011 relating to sexual offenses, obscene publications or offenses regarding the life of the unborn shall be held to be inconsistent with or in contravention of the provisions of this chapter. Now, this is a provision which was put into the Charter of Rights as a result of submissions that were made um, to the Joint Select Committee considering um, the, the bill um, by the submissions that were made by the Lawyers Christian Fellowship and the uh, committee accepted the submissions made by the Lawyers Christian Fellowship, and except for one phrase, um, accepted the, 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 the proposed saving law clause verbatim. So this was what was proposed by the Lawyers Christian Fellowship, and it now forms part of our constitution. What is the significance of this provision? So this is what we call a saving law clause, and it would be a specific saving law clause because it refers to specific legislation, sexual offenses, obscene publications, or offenses regarding the life of the unborn. Now, what this provision does is that it prevents any law relating to any of these three things from being held to be inconsistent with or in contravention of any of the rights provision of the Charter. I like to think of it as basically saying that um, 
it is accepted that these laws are consistent with the rights provision, meaning that none of the rights provisions are um, contravened by these laws. So we had the passage of the Charter of Rights. Then you had what was the um, passing of the Sexual Offenses Act and um, the Sexual Offenses Registry, um, which was provided for in regulations made under the Sexual Offenses Act in 2012. And specific reference is made to the creation of the Sexual Offenders Registry. Now, what is the importance of the Sexual Offenses um, Registry? It's what the Sexual Offenses Registry does is that it makes uh, the offense of buggery found in Section 76. Um, just to say, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you have stopped screen sharing. Did you intend yes, to do yes, that? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay. I, I intended to do that. Okay. So what the, um, what the Sexual Offenders Registry did was that it made um, the, the relevant sections, um, what we term as the buggery law, which deals with buggery and gross indecency, specified offenses where if one is found guilty of any of these offenses, you uh, may be required to register as a sex offender. And remember the, the dates here. We have the Charter of Rights being passed in 2011, and then these specific provisions in the Sexual Offenses Act and the regulations came into effect in 2012. And so now we have, in 2015, a challenge being made by Maurice Tomlinson to our Bogley laws. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. So oh, I'm still not sharing. Okay. Can everybody see this? Bogey okay, law so decision on... white matters. Should that be the slide? Yes. Yes. And can... you're seeing the second slide after that? November 27. Yes. yes. So on November 27, 2015, a claim was filed in the Supreme Court by Maurice Tomlinson against the Attorney General of Jamaica. And that claim challenged the constitutionality of Section 76, 77, and 79 of the Offenses Against the Persons Act to the extent that they apply to what the claim referred to as consensual sexual activities between persons aged 16 or older, including persons of the same sex. And the claim assert, asserted that the sections were unconstitutional because they contravened the right to liberty and to freedom of the person, the right to security of the person, the right to freedom of expression, the right to equality before the law, and in the case of Section 59, the right to freedom from discrimination on the ground of being male or female, the right to respect for and protection of private and family life and of the privacy of the home, and the right to protection from inhumane or degrading punishment or other treatment. Section 7 um, is the section that deals with the crime of buggery, and that is the section I have set out there verbatim. So it makes um, the offense of buggery um, committed either with mankind or with an animal, liable um, to be, um, the person who has been convicted of the offense is liable to be imprisoned and kept to hard labor for a term if not exceeding 10 years. Then you have section 77, which creates, I would say, several offenses here. It, it creates the, uh, it deals with the attempted um, burglary, indecent, as an, an indecent assault. Then you have section 79, which is the section which deals with gross indecency. Now, when this claim was filed in 2015, um, in early 2016, several groups made an application, made applications to the court to be joined as interested parties and were granted um, such permission. Then you had an application being made by the Attorney General in 2019 where the Attorney General sought to have a trial of a preliminary issue. And the preliminary issue was for the court to determine whether or not the saving law clause that we looked at um, just now, whether or not that clause prevented um, the sections that were being challenged from 
um, being from being declared unconstitutional. That application was heard and refused initially um, by the Supreme Court judge and the Attorney General appealed that decision and the Court of Appeal um, granted that, that appeal so that a trial date was set um, and took place in June of this year to try the issue of whether or not the saving law clause applied. If the saving law clause applied, it would mean that the claimant could not um, challenge the constitutionality of these sections. And of course, if it did not apply, then he could. Charger Miller, claimant... what should this slide be saying to us now? No, I, yes, I, I, I'm not moving any further. It okay, is, it is looking at the, at the section. Section 79. In fact, right. I, I will stop sharing my, my screen because I'm finished with that slide. Right. So the, the trial um, took place and the main issue before the court, because um, if, I, if I will take you back very quickly to the, uh, what the if, if you look at what the uh, saving law clause says, it says nothing contained in or done under the authority of any law in force immediately before the commencement of the charter. So it only covers laws relating to sexual offenses, obscene publications, or offenses regarding the life of the unborn, which were in force immediately before the charter. It means then that where there um, would be any amendments to these laws after the charter came into force, this saving law clause would not apply. And so the issue that the court had to determine um, at the trial of the preliminary issue was whether or not there was an amendment to the sections 76, 77, and 79 of the Offenses Against a Persons Act, which were challenged um, by the claimant. Um, and that is the background to the decision um, that the court made in October of this year. So I will hand over to uh, Mr. Wilkins for, for him to deal with that actual decision. Thank you very much, Jamila, for your very comprehensive um, exploration of this matter. In terms of the background, I just want to add that this question of homosexuality, which I term same-sexness, has a plan regarding it, and there are purposeful forces that are bent on going from jurisdiction to jurisdiction where there are certain, what they term, colonial, archaic, outdated laws to remove them from the books so that questions of homosexuality is no longer an issue and same sex, sexness in various forms can take place. So historically, one would have seen a number of interventions in various countries, Belize, Trinidad, Barbados, in Jamaica here also, where these matters are put in court to seek to impugn these, what they term as old, colonial, imperial, outdated laws and remove them and they utilize the constitutional approach to impugn these laws. Now, as Jamelia said, we have the so-called Bogri law in section 76 and 77 and 79 of the Offenses Against the Persons Act. And that was the attack by the claimant, Mr. Maurice Tomlinson. As Jamelia says, the matter was narrowed to an issue regarding the saving laws clause. So the substantive matter of whether there is constitution, constitutionality in terms of privacy laws and equality and discrimination and all of that is not part of this judgment. 
So the narrow aspect as to whether a court can inquire into the provisions of the constitution that deals with sexual offenses or the saving law clause no longer saves or makes immune the provisions of that um, sexual, sexual offenses law, the burglary law. And therefore it is open for the court to look at those provisions and to say that they are contrary to the constitution. So that is a narrow issue that came before the court. Now, the matter is somewhat complex because many rules of interpretation were utilized and many cases were brought to the fore and submissions made. But I will try and be simple in the analysis so that we can easily grasp what was before the court and how the court decided. So you will find in many constitutions, like our Jamaican constitution, a law, a component of the law, which saves previous existing law. What is the purpose of that? The simple pur pur purpose is to bring over laws that exist just before the constitution came into effect into the new dispensation so that these bring over laws are applicable and there will be certainty in the administration of government. So nobody will wonder whether all existing laws exist in the new dispensation under the constitution. So the methodology which is used is this saving law clause. And Jamila has indicated it is in our constitution under the Charter of Fundamental Rights Provisions and it really seeks to preserve what was pre-existing law. Now the issue is whether or not indeed that is the effect of it and whether the court our court can say no, there is no protection for these old archaic laws because there are provisions of the constitution that are being infringed, the privacy laws and so forth. So it's a very narrow matter that came before the court for the judges to decide. And what was the reasoning of the court? The court recognized that the judiciary is separate from the legislature and therefore the judiciary is empowered to interpret the law and apply it. They are not policy makers. They are not moral makers are they pronounced on morality or matters of religion. They are strictly um, there to interpret the law and apply it. And therefore, if parliament has an intention of a particular nature, and that is the particular effect of what parliament intends, and it is clear, then notwithstanding other external considerations, then the judiciary is bound to follow what the intendment of the legislature is. So the issue before the court, or one of the major issue, is whether or not the matter of sexual offenses was saved by the saving law clause, which says, in a nutshell, whatever law exists before the coming into being of that um, that um, charter in relationship to specifically in this matter, sexual offenses, whether they exist and they are brought over, whether when they, when they are brought over, they have the impact of being good law still 
because there's a view that modernity and certain other principles of interpretation, for example, the living tree approach of interpretation of um, the constitution should by use of those interpretative methods um, change and get rid of old inapplicable principles and laws. However, in this um, court matter, arguments were put up that in interpreting the savings law clause, there is a particular way to look at as to whether the intendment of parliament was directly and intentionally to save the old law that pre-existed. And this court is of the view that that was the intendment of the legislator because they specifically set out a narrow approach to what was to be saved, sexual offenses. That did not settle the matter, however, because the question arose as to what is meant by sexual offenses. Now, the court examined quite a number of authorities because sexual offenses was not defined by the statute. It's not in the Sexual Offenses Act. It's not in the Offenses Against the Persons Act um, um, as to what is meant by sexual offenses. And it's not in the Constitution. So interpretation of what is meant by sexual offenses. And therefore, what Maurice Tomlinson is trying to get permitted in private is it a sexual offenses? The court looked at ordinary meaning, a kind of dictionary approach. It looked at some cases. It looked at some historical development of the term sexual offenses and came to the conclusion that sexual offenses would include that activity that the claimant Maurice Tomlinson was trying to get allowed as being a constitutional right. So it means, therefore, that the term sexual offenses could be impacted by the savings law clause. However, there was also before the court this matter of whether the savings law clause should be liberally interpreted so that it conforms with constitutional provisions are narrowly. And there were two very important cases that came up for consideration, a Lambert Watson case and Chandler case. And the synopsis or the essence to be extracted from those two cases was that if the particular legislative instrument is clearly and unambiguously saying that this particular law, pre-existing law, is saved, then that is the proper interpretation to be given. And the court, consisting of the three judges, came to the conclusion that the, that the, the existing um, provisions in the Constitution really was to bring over section 76, 77, and 79 of the Offenses Against the Persons Act. That was the intention. And therefore, if that is the intention of Parliament, then the court is not in a position, even if they have a different view, for whatever reason, to interfere with the intention of Parliament. And as a result, the court unanimously came to the decision that in fact, this particular specific saving laws clause, which points to sexual offenses that pre-existed, meant in effect, and this was the intention of parliament, to bring over the relevant sections 
of the offenses against the persons act that is the bogey law and it remains valid law and in effect notwithstanding the various provisions of the charter the the court went on to remind themselves that although there are many interpretations of um, sexual offenses and there are many approaches to whether or not a particular constitution allows for same-sexness and all laws coming from the colonial period are no longer applicable. The court is of the view in this case on a, on a proper cons constitutional construction of the savings law clause that it is applicable to sexual offenses that Mr. Morris Tomlinson is trying to get the court to say is valid and should not be um, there should not be any provisions in the law to prevent what he wants to happen in private between consenting adults. Well, not adults, but persons who are 16 years and over, specifically. So the essence of this particular judgment is that the court is not looking at the substantive matter as to the constitutionality of um, the Bogri law, but it is looking at whether or not there is a particular provision in the constitution itself which saves pre-existing law from being inquired into. And therefore, the law that pre-existed, in this case, the Bogri law, still applies as valid um, law, binding, and is not in conflict with the constitutional provisions. So it is a good judgment consistent with what the defendant was saying and the interested parties. And therefore it brings to an end the substantive matter of Maurice Tomlinson so that he cannot really proceed any further with that aspect of the matter unless of course he appeals successfully and he has indicated that he's given up any further proceedings and will not appeal. So this case stands now as the authority to say that the Bogri law still stands and it is not um an uh, unconstitutional provision in the old law. And therefore, it is victory for the defendant, the attorney general, in this matter. It does not mean, of course, that at the appropriate time, other attempts may be made on the substantive matter, especially if we move forward to the Caribbean Court of Justice because their interpretation of law is a little different. And therefore, one can anticipate that further attempts in court will be made to impugn the Bogri law. So we have to be careful that we do not relax, but keep our eyes open and be ready to contest any such further effort to impugn the Bogri law and to do away with it by constitutional challenge. So there ends my brief presentation on the matter of what the court ruled on. And the question and answer would be invited at this stage. Um, before we go into the question and answer, uh, so the, 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 the topic, as I understand it, is the case and then why it matters. So I, I would just briefly say that as uh, Mr. Wilkins has pointed out, this case is not a case brought in isolation. There is clearly an organized agenda to leg legitimize same-sex relationships throughout the Caribbean with its ultimate goal being same-sex marriage. And 
um, this case is very significant because, and I can be corrected, but um, as far as I'm aware, it's the only burglary challenge in the Caribbean so far which um, has not succeeded. Yes, because in right. all the other Caribbean countries where the burglary law has been challenged, um, it has been successfully challenged. And so we have managed to prevent um, the agenda from going any further in Jamaica. Thank you, Jamila. And I'm sure I speak on, be on behalf of thousands who may or may not understand it at the moment, but we are truly grateful for what you and Wendell have done and the many hours of research and preparation and then delivery in making submissions before the court. And so we just say highest commendations and deepest gratitude for what you have done for Jamaica. We are truly, truly grateful. So just want Thank to you. know, you're welcome. I just want to know, pick up on a couple of the points. First, Wendell, you raised the matter of the CCJ. What yeah. have you seen there in terms of their approach to this theme and their own rulings that makes you say that it would it might be a different case if the matter were yes. to the TCJ? We have plotted a, a interpretative graph <laughs> of the CCJ. It's a liberal court that adopts um, other jurisdictional judgments out of Europe and Canada which favors um, same-sexness. And it pays attention to these cases in a liberal way and also to certain opinions coming from international organizations where there is this view that homosexuality is a human right. And this Caribbean Court of Justice is in favor of that kind of interpretation. And they have adopted, for example, the term um, sex to include sexual orientation. Our constitution doesn't define, it does say sex, but it's adopting the European, North American approach to human sexuality in the jurisprudence. So it is believed that if a constitutional matter comes before them from Jamaica, it might very well mean that they will give a liberal interpretation and adopt the European and North American approach to human sexuality. And we do know that there's a move afoot to move the Privy Council out of being our final court of appeal to the Caribbean Court of Justice. So if that happens, then the battle will certainly um, start again. That is the expectation. And I would also add, because we, we do have two specific cases coming from the CCJ, which will examine um, this, um, the interpretation of a saving law clause. And in fact, the, the um, conclusion coming out of the CCJ is actually inconsistent with uh, the Privy Council's um, interpretation and application of the Saving Law Clause. So in those two CCJ cases, in fact, um, the Saving Law Clause was pretty much dismissed. Um, um, no regard was had for the Saving Law Clause because the position of the court was that... Uh, the question was whether or not a right was being breached and they had the power um, in, in, in those circumstances to do away with the saving law clause. Um, and so if it was that the CCJ was considering Mr. Tomlinson's case, it most likely would not have um, upheld the saving law clause as, as being applicable. And that liberal trend and posture has a factor in our conversations about whether we stay with Privy Council or go to um, Caribbean Court of Justice, it cannot be silenced. That sort of jumping over an obvious legal issue that was set up by our legislature that um, just speaks of an activism on behalf of the court. But let me ask either of you, by way of comparison, what did you find or do you find from the Privy Council then in their reasoning and trend of reasoning on these kinds of themes in, in cases brought before them? Well, what, what I find is that 
the 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 judges from the judicial committee of the Privy Council, which are the same judges that sit in the highest court, the Supreme Court in England, same judges. They have a, a more narrow approach to interpretation. They look at intention of the legislature and they respect what the legislature says. So if the legislator says X is the law, they say that courts must accept that and do not adopt necessarily a liberal, purposeful, living tree interpretation that brings something that was passed as law long ago, modernize it, tweak it, and make it more relevant to society nowadays. And you know that's a danger because there, there is a, a rule of interpretation that you must look at what parliament wants. But there's another rule that says that when you are interpreting, you must make it modern and to fit with more um, acceptable thinking. And that is the danger of judicial activism, as you mentioned. And we're talking about an old law that is still very much current in its application and relevance because we're talking about human design, the human body and human behavior and the impact of the choices of humans on society. So this law is still very current and relevant. Jamila, yes, it's, just... it's always, I will just add, it's always interesting to me when persons um, um, say archaic and old law and I'm thinking aren't most of our laws now archaic and old? So, I mean, the fact that a law is old does not mean it is it is no longer applicable. Right, you know? right, right. But Jamila, speaking about the other Caribbean territories that have also faced a challenge to their boggy laws, can you say something on what accounts for the difference of outcome between there and here? Yes, indeed. And, and, and that is why I started my history with the inclusion of the specific saving law clause in our charter, because I think that that is the difference. So in 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 Belize, of course, Belize is is a special case in the Caribbean in the, in the sense that um, it has never um, it, it, even when um, Belize be, uh, became independent, its constitution only had a saving law clause that lasted for a certain number of years. So there was no um, issue of a saving law clause when the court in Belize was considering the challenge to the Burgundy law. Similarly, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, even though Trinidad and Tobago has um, saving law clauses, a general one um, from their um, from the the, 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 the the from the first constitution and then when they had the constitution revised, um, the Burgundy law would have been amended since then. And so it was still not applicable. And that's the same thing in Barbados, um, where there would have been amendment, an amendment to their Bogre law since the passing of their constitution, which um, made the saving law clause inapplicable. So the, the difference in, 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 in um, those countries and Jamaica would be our saving law clause. We should mention, though, that uh, Trinidad and Tobago, their attorney general, has appealed the decision. And so yes, there's an appeal pending. Um, right. and I'm not sure if Barbados is, is appealing theirs because there's a very recent decision. Right, right. And then there's still an ongoing case in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So judgment. Yes, and I believe um, I think there is there also one in St. Lucia. I think in my research I came across something like that. Mm, okay, okay. Um, perhaps you could make a comment about our Charter of Rights. And um, Wendell, you mentioned about the reinterpretation of sex to include sexual orientation. I do recall from the notes or the minutes of the Joint Select Committee that was um, reviewing or preparing the, the chart of rights that JFLAG, which is the local um, LGBT activist group, had submitted to the committee uh, making or establishing sexual orientation as a ground for non-discrimination. And the committee very explicitly said that will not be accepted and will not be, we won't be accepted. And it was not accepted as a ground for non-discrimination and that sex is male or female. And that would be the sole definition given. So we've had that experience of sexual orientation being attempted to be brought into the constitution. Yes. 
from 2009. Yes. Now I have a question here. Commendations to the LCF. In a nutshell, what particular steps could or should we anticipate in future attempts to remove the savings law clause? Either of you. Sorry, um, you well, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear it. Could you repeat? Should we question? should we anticipate attempts to remove the savings law clause in the future? Yes, I think it, it will come through claims, further claims, but not right now because of this judgment. But as I say, if there's a change in the final court and we are before the CCJ, it may be that the claimants in, in that kind of scenario believe it is more profitable or more fertile. But remember now, in the Jamaican setting, the political directorate is aware of how the Jamaican people feel about same sex sexness. And therefore, there might not be any hurry to make any direct removal from the legislative point of view of the savings law clause. So um, because of the political implications of it. So it means that everything will be left to the court eventually. But I don't think our legislator would be that um, an um, anxious to change that law as is. Right. And as I, I would so I would look at that question in two aspects. You have as Wendell is looking at it as um, amending the saving law clause in the Constitution, whether to remove it um, as well um, um, in respect of, of any of the, 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 the offenses that it currently deals with. So that's one aspect. Or you could have um, the, the saving law clause could remain. But if there is an amendment to the laws that it covers, then it could render the application of the saving law clause to those laws um, of no effect. It will no longer mm -hmm. apply to those laws. So what we it's, it's not just um, watching out for Parliament amending the Constitution in respect of the saving law clause or challenges in the court um, where the CCJ may or another court may give a very liberal um, interpretation so that it doesn't apply the saving law clause. But we also have to... Um, be careful to, 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 to make sure that the laws are not themselves amended mm -hmm. so that um, the saving law clause is no longer applicable. Right. And just to remind our audience, we're talking about three categories. We're talking about sexual offenses, the life of the unborn. So we're talking about laws that prohibit abortion and obscene publication. Publication, yes. So watch what is the discussions, whether in parliament or outside, concerning those three subject areas. So the next question. Just to be clear on that point, yeah. if if Parliament looks at section 76, 77, and 79, and and the language there is not um in keeping with what is the current thinking and seeks to amend it, so you're going to have a new law with a different complexion. That change. In the Bogri law. <laughs> so it be Bogri law too, and mm. not the old one, will mm. create a problem. So, as it will mean in that modernization where the old language is, is removed, an attempt mm. misguided <laughs> to, to keep the, the Bogri law in a different form, more palatable, mm. will be changed law, and the savings law clause would not apply to a change law situation. Right. Mm. Yeah. So this ancient boundary stone must be left untouched. You are that saying is, that is so. That is the best <laughs> way to deal with it. So here's another question. Then what? I, I, I must. I don't know. So, sorry, Philip. It's okay. <laughs> it's a section in the state called law reform. You know, there's a law reform. Yeah. Division. Mm -hmm. And part of their work is to look at old law. <laughs> I need to modernize and change them. So we have to keep our eyes open to see Absolutely. if there is any organization that yeah. is coming through the back door. Right, <laughs> right, right. So the next question, 
Is there any legal protection that can be instituted yeah. by organizations like the church in Jamaica to ensure further protection from same-sex impositions? Well, I'm, I'm not too sure how to, uh, that's, that's a very general question. Um, but one thing I, I think we should point out, which mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if, if any other country has this, but it, we don't just have our burglary law, but we have defined uh, marriage in our constitution as between one man and one woman, single man, single woman. Right. So we have that added protection as well um, in, our, in, in, um, in our constitution, which um, clearly distinguishes heterosexual um, from homosexual. So there is a clear distinction being made and there's a clear um, definition given to marriage, which clearly shows what it is that our country is saying that we accept as, as a marriage here. Right, right. Yeah, in a yeah. matter like this, um, church advocacy is very mm -hmm. important. Now, I do know that there is a culture among some churches to keep quiet. They're not involved in politics. They're not, they stay away from state matters. But certainly when it comes to human sexuality, they have to be strong advocates based upon what the Bible says. Because if they remain silent by saying things are politics and the state and stay far from any kind of voicing of what they believe in, it can be a problem. Right, right. And it's not just watching an advocacy on the law itself, but it's also culture and society. And if the younger generation feel that, you know, being liberal is okay, then you may find that younger generation then is influencing or calling for changes in, in the law because this is the world. And as you mentioned, Philip, right. right. We have to keep our eyes open because even in our education system, educational material from what I call up north <laughs> will seep in, which right. tends to show what a family is and what all sorts of things can be in, in an attempt to normalize things which ought not to be normalized. So we not only have to watch parliament, watch what is happening in the court, but also what is happening in the ministries and those who seek to educate our children. Absolutely. And we've already had that experience with the law still in place 11 years ago, where curricula was discovered advocating that very normalization of homosexual behaviors. And so this is another reason why it is important to keep the law in place so that the education curricula can be assessed, evaluated, and what is False, fake science can be removed and what is true adhering to anatomy and biology is retained. So we have a question still on the schools is whether in the government's approach to include the high school's input into the constitution, I guess this is the constitutional reform discussions that are taking place. Will the student be exposed to making wrong inputs due to bias of government? Um, well, it depends, it depends on the forum and whether or not <laughs> the children have been um, influenced beforehand as to what their thought processes should be. But we go back to parenting now. What am I parenting my child about and the principles? Is it according to the worldview of society now? especially with social media so popular, or is it on a biblical basis? So we have to train up our children to be firm and not to follow undue influences that may be around, including social media. Because sometimes those um, bombardment from those sources create a normalization. Another question. Could you briefly outline what exactly would be the mischief of decriminalizing private sexual acts between consenting males? Jamila, you want to take that? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, she seems to be frozen. Yes. All right. I, I oh, she's on. gone. And okay. Hopefully she'll be able to join back. Yes. Um, as Christians, we follow what the Bible says, and the Bible is clear on that kind of behavior. Also, there is a wealth of information on the health side that is out there to indicate that that kind of activity has serious health consequences. There are many studies and researches on that. So those are two good reasons that we can put on the table, of course, to discuss, <laughs> to discuss. But we have to be very careful we don't say whatever is done is in private is okay. We have to be very careful with that because there is a philosophy that is developing the me, me, what I call the me, me and I, I <laughs> philosophy that what I want to do, especially in private, I should be allowed to do it. Right. Where you, where you do an act doesn't make it safe. Mm -hmm. it, it's the act itself, <laughs> the inherent nature of the act and its impact both on yourself and, and others. You're part of a community in society. Okay. Yes. Jamila, did you hear the question before you? Fell off. I did not. I fell off um, my internet okay. went for a, a few seconds. So the question was, what do you think is the mischief of decriminalizing private sex acts between consenting males? The mistress of the mischief of decriminalizing private acts. The mischief of decriminalizing private acts. Well, I mean, I think you 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 were hitting the nail on the head right there. Um, and, you know, a lot, this, this notion of something done in private means it's not hurting anyone, um, you know, is, is, is really um, something to me that, that when you look at it, um, does not necessarily um, follow. It's not logical um, necessarily when you think about it. As you said, it is not the fact that it is done in private that matters. It is what is being done that matters. Right. So, the other thing I want to mention quickly too is that the studies that we have seen indicates that the the um decriminalization in private of homosexual acts is really a gateway leading up to the question of family and marriage. That is how it normally goes. Once you start there, then the next thing is same-sex marriages. And therefore, the whole foundation of true family is going to be adversely affected. I recall Caleb Or Orozco, who was a claimant in the Belizean case, in his exuberance at having won, he then declared, we're not finished here, or we're coming after marriage next, or words to those effects. And that's what he had said in the Belize case. I'm going to take a couple more questions before we close. Could the law on indecent exposure deal with the dance hall promotional materials? Indecent, indecent. Oh, okay. Um, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm not recalling exactly what that law says. The dance hall materials. I'm guessing in they're trying of, to say if indecent dance hall materials that they would consider indecent, whether um, indecent exposure, but exposure has to do with uh, attendee. It has to do with what the person does, their action in exposing right. themselves in an indecent fashion. In I wonder if you may um, mean, setting. right. I wonder if they meant obscene publications. Maybe mm. that's what they're thinking of, whether indecent yes. or improper content in dance hall materials could right. be fitted under obscene publications. And it probably could. You would have to um, then show that it is obscene or indecent. Right. And then um, that as a publication, it should be removed, struck down. Right. In, right. In the it falls within the definition. Yes, in the criminal justice system, you have about three laws that touch upon pornography, indecent um, publications and in indecent behavior. So you will find those laws being applicable. Question, will the US pressure us to cause a radical shift? They repeal their Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA Act. Well, Attendee, let me add, it's not just the US, it's the EU as well. And this is the current topic. 
this new ACPE agreement and what is in it and what are the implications for Jamaica based on the commitments that our government might make under that agreement. So it's not just the USA, it's wherever the advocacy for repealing such laws that protect family and uh, human identity are where they're coming from. So, Yeah, and I must add, there, there is a tendency for classification um, to be made by these countries and they put you into various categories according to the state of your laws and if you are in a good category then there are certain um, economic benefits <laughs> that one gets and um, inter-country relationships improve but if you are in a certain other category you find that you don't qualify for this and you don't qualify for that and you don't have um, favored status in trade and relations and all sorts of things. And for a country that is not strong economically and is small, then that can be really pressuring. Right. But we have to honestly and seriously weigh what do we gain and what do we lose? can't throw away our morality and their cost to society if you open the gate and remove all of these boundaries that are for the good of humans and flourishing and children right we have to yes, and the that. question is are we for sale right people are more likely to support the buggery law when they understand it leads to transgenderism please draw a clear outline of how one leads to another so we can share with others well, um, coming out of strict legality and the law, I do know that the adversary is creating a lot of confusion in this area. And therefore, you find that there's a lot of new beliefs regarding one's human sexuality and it's becoming more and more popular. And people are discovering that they are X one day, and they are why another day, and they are making demands that these feelings, these uh, positions should be respected as a matter of law. And if anybody objects to my feelings or my opinions or my behavior, that objection is a crime. So from a perspective of changing, changing um, approaches to how the family is being adversely attacked, you will find that kind of confusion and tension developing. And as usual, because of political survival and popularity, you'll find the laws being adjusted from time to time to reflect these new developments and confusion that is created deliberately as an attack on the family, as we know it. And they, they, they are based on the same ideology. You know, it is linking human identity to what I feel my gender is or what my sexuality is. So it's, it's based on the same ideology. So, I mean, I, I think when you follow both of them, the logical conclusion is it's based on the same identity, um, ideology. Right. And what we've also found is that those countries that have introduced sexual orientation into law as a ground for non-discrimination, the definition is wide enough, it's fluid enough to include same-sex um, relationships and whatever persons feel like is their desired and preference. And then it is accompanied by the term gender identity, which then goes to say, I'm born female, I'm born male, but I feel I am the other sex or anything else. So you find the, the twinning of those two phrases, once they're introduced into law under the grounds for non-discrimination, then transgenderism is given, you know, open door, open access. I'm gonna take one more last, uh, one last question before we close, because we did promise to be here for an hour. How may we get word out concerning the intention of the CCJ to legalize same-sex relationships and how government and the opposition are referring to the UK Privy Council as our colonial masters to turn people's opinions away from the Privy Council. So how to get the word out about what CACCJ is really all about 
and that Privy Council ain't so bad <laughs> after all. <laughs> yes, um, we do have a problem there because it seems as if the political directorate is in favor of that change away from the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council to the Caribbean Court of Justice. We will have to do some public education in this regard amongst our church members and the general public to indicate the pros and cons of that change. Because, you know, many years ago, this question of liberation from the colonial um, empire was very, very active, but there are certain adversities and disadvantages that come with it, in particular uh, re relating to this matter of same-sexness. So we have to do some serious education and advocacy there so that our view may prevail and that we do not rush into the CCJ because it's a matter of sovereignty and independence. Absolutely. And for us to really assess the issues based on law and reasoning and not simply to use the emotive uh, feelings that would come from talking about colonialism and the past, we're talking about how courts handle law and how they interpret law. And also whether going to CCJ and their ruling is going to bring us under a new kind of colonialism, neo-imperialism by this false and flawed ideology that they're being instructed by. Yes. Right. So I did say last question, but because of who is asking this question, I'm going to allow one, one, one more. What implicit or explicit practices by organizations in Jamaica can be considered illegal because of the legality of the Bogri law, consider J flag. Perhaps I could um, start off the answering to say that J flag is still subject to the laws, offense against the person act. So it's their behavior that would be subject to the law, but there wouldn't be a law preventing them to associate and assemble and to exist as a legal entity. Um, it, it is really culture and society that would be responding to their messaging to say that that is not what we accept. That's not what the route that we want to take. So in terms of their existence as an organization, uh, that there's nothing illegal about them doing so, but the message would have to be rejected by society. Yeah, I think that's a fair summary. <laughs> in other words, they have a constitutional right to put forward their views. But if they go beyond that, and actually commit an offense under the the um the various statutes, then they'll be subject, like anybody else, to prosecution. Well, we just want to say thank you again so much, Wendell and Jamila, for all that you have done in serving Jamaica by pursuing this case, and um, all the interested parties actually that were party to this case were grateful for their commitment. And we're thankful that the government um, was willing to take this case and uh, pursue the law, pursue the law. And we're grateful for the decision that has come down. Um, we know that at least one of the judges expressed their opinion on the whole trend of where cases have been going in other jurisdictions. And had the savings law clause not been in place, there might have been a different decision. But we're grateful that the judges stuck to the law as well and upheld the, the, the savings law clause. So really, really grateful to you. Are any last words from you, Wendell and Jamila? Yes, my last word is that we have to be alert. We have to be watchful because this is a battle. We might have a victory here, but it is not all over yet. I suspect the persons who are pursuing matters like um, Tomlinson will be gathering and making new and fresh plans to come forward. So we have to just be on the watch. And in the meanwhile, we educate ourselves. So we're not going to only watch in terms of the court activities, but watch the political directorate. In case they come under pressure <laughs> and they decide to, to change things, and we don't even know what is going on. 
We have to watch the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, all the ministries that do external relations because they have a tendency of going off with their technocrats, signing things. And when they return, we don't know until years later. They pull out a document <laughs> and say, this is what we signed two years ago, which puts us in a bind. So we have to watch when they are going abroad, demanding, where are you going? What are you <laughs> intending to sign? <laughs> Report back to me when you come back and so forth. If we get too lackadaisical and we just mind our own little business, things will slip through. Yes, I would I would echo what um, Wendell has said. And you know, what struck me as I have been thinking about this case is, is two things. Preparation, strategic planning. Because the success of this case didn't just come about because interested parties intervene and the government um, you know, defended um, the matter. But the success of this case came about because when the Charter of Rights was being considered, submissions were made to Parliament about putting in a savings law clause. If that savings law clause was not put in, there may very well have been a different outcome um, in this case. Long-term planning, looking into the future and seeing the trends in other jurisdicts, jurisdictions. What happened in the USA and Canada and, the, and, the, and Europe? And consider how this would impact us in the near and the immediate and the future, long-term future. All right, before and we go, I'm going to... Yes. Also, we have to pay attention to what is happening in Africa too. Because Africa, some countries there are being put on a tremendous pressure. Yes. Because their laws are being strengthened. <laughs> And we have to know that these are the consequences that can flow if we continue to resist, in their view, quote unquote, resist <laughs> what they want us to do. So we have to have a worldview and watch what is happening and prepare ourselves for the struggle. Right, right. I'm going to share a screen um, as we leave, just a little um, acronym out using the word bogri to say why we must keep the Bogri law. It's a barrier to the normalization of deviant behaviors. It undergirds marriage legally and philosophically. It guards freedom of speech. It guides public officials in writing laws and policies, as well as educational materials. And the media is prevented from normalizing LGBT lifestyles. Religious liberties are preserved as well as access to reparative counseling. So consider this persons who may be struggling with same-sex attraction, same-sex desires, wants help. If the law said that what they're feeling is normal and okay, then how can they get assistance if what they're feeling is normal and okay? But they want assistance, but how can they get help if the law says that there's no problem and their struggle isn't real? And then why? Youth can be warned about health risks. And so we say to persons, make sure you're on the voters list. If ever this issue is brought to a referendum, we want to be ready and prepared so that we can vote to keep the law in place because this is what it does. It's not just about two individuals in the privacy of their bedroom. We're talking about what's happening in the bedroom, having an effect in the boardrooms and the public space. So this law is an important protector that must be maintained. So I want to thank our presenters again, Wendell Wilkins and Jamila Thomas for joining us this evening to share with us on this case. Perhaps this conversation will continue in the future, but we really want to say thanks for all that you have done and uh, may the Lord richly bless you and that you get some good sleep now that the case is over, <laughs> and recover those hours that were spent laboring over text and preparing. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, who joined us this evening. Really great to have had you. Remember, if you're not in the mailing list, drop your email address in the chat, and I will add it to the mailing list. And check the Issachar Foundation Jamaica YouTube channels channel for previous lectures as well as this one and we look forward to seeing you again. Have a good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for coming.